as well. Ah, seems to be working. Okay, great. And I think the audio is good. I should probably monitor this somehow, but I'm not going to. I can sort of hear myself on my phone on Twitch. And I will pause the video to talk about different concepts and maybe stop for five minutes to um, uh, draw some diagrams on uh, Excalibur or something else. And uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. All right. I don't see anyone joining the stream yet, but I'm sure some people will. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, let's uh, let's start. Let's get rid of the Discord thing here and press play. So the next one, I'm going to talk about a topic that's kind of tied in many ways to microservices. And both of my other topics are tied of to microservices in many ways. Um, Okay, uh, first of all, um, event sourcing, it's not coupled to microservices at all. Um, I'm not sure if he's trying to uh, relate event sourcing to uh, a track that's uh, being uh, themed as microservices, but uh, there's nothing about event sourcing that makes you need to think about microservices uh, whatsoever. Uh, criticism number one. So. I'll try to be fair and uh, give him credit for things that he gets right. Uh, so let's continue. And this is one on event sourcing. Event sourcing is a term, it actually is a term I came up with, um, to describe a common pattern. Well, a pattern that I saw a few times. Okay, pattern. Um, wow, that's totally understating how important event sourcing is. Uh, calling event sourcing a pattern lumps it in with something like strategy or observer or anything else. Um, event sourcing is entirely the idea to not throw away information. It is fundamentally more than a pattern. It's an information strategy rather than a pattern. And this is does an incredible amount of disservice to, uh, to event sourcing. So, okay. That's two. Maybe I should keep a little tally of how many criticisms I have. Well, that's two so far. I think I'll open up Kate here, uh, editor, and uh, I'll write some notes down here. So two times an information. Let's just uh, do that. So criticism number one was microservices it says have nothing to do with event sourcing. You certainly can use it there, but that is not something. Uh, what was my second criticism? I forget. There was a second criticism. I'll come back to that. And a third criticism was that the event sourcing is not just a pattern. Okay. So I'm assuming there's going to be a Another criticism. Let's just say uh, good points down here. Let's be fair. And uh, we'll wait for the first good point here. Okay, so this is criticisms. And then good points here. Let's hope it's plural. Okay, right, I'll review a little bit here. Systems. A, a pattern that I saw a few times in information systems, but one that I felt was as good as using the term information systems instead of programming. Isn't used as widely as it could be, and still isn't used widely as it could be. Um, another understatement here, as widely as it could be, it should, as far as I'm concerned, be the default, since you're not losing information and allows you to have a number of incredibly big advantages for getting away from a ton of dysfunction in in how we write systems. Um, so what is it? Well, the basic explanation is, I, I think, pretty simple. Let's imagine we're building a system that manages people's addresses, simple address book. 
and somebody wants to say, OK, I'd like to change my address, please. You've got a simple relationship between some kind of person record, some kind of address record. What you do? You just blow away the old address record, create a new one, hook it up to the person. That's basically how... Well, that's kind of not correct. You don't blow away the old address. A lot of times you update a row and uh, change a few fields that could possibly have address as one of them. But let's be fair, maybe using another way of uh, writing an application where you could blow away the record entirely. Um, on, maybe you're super normalized and you share addresses between different people because you might have a spouse and their spouse in the same thing in an insurance company, but I don't think this is the blowing away a record is usually what happens. There's an update. Uh, theoretically, yes, you do technically blow away the last state of that record and it is lost, which is, I think, the point that's being made. But anyway, there are some important differences here that may confuse people when they're looking at um, event sourcing and uh, removing entire records instead of updating rows. You work that kind of... So that's basically how we mostly do our systems. We make changes to our data stores. Now, the event sourcing system puts in a slight variation to this. So faced with that same question, I'd like to change my address, what do we do here? Well, we actually divide our view of the world into two bits. And the first thing we do when we change our address is we create an event that captures this change, summarizes up what the change should be. Then we apply this to the same database that we had before. It's getting on a little way ahead of event sourcing. This is his interpretation of what event sourcing is, just because he claimed state of statement of like record or ledger in computers is event sourcing. Fine, um, let it be called that. But you don't need to have a materialized view of those records. You can simply have those events and source all information from them. There is nothing about event sourcing that requires you to have a materialized view in said tables to make your application work. You could simply query over the events that are written to do that. And that is event sourcing in its simplest form. So you do not need two bits to make event sourcing work. And actually make the change. I think that uh, kind of implies CKRS to make two bits. So points event sourcing as requiring Uh, tables or other materialized views or projections of events and it does not. Continue on. So what we've ended up is dividing our uh, uh, store of knowledge of the world into two parts. An application state, which is the current state of the world, and a log of events, everything that's ever happened to change that world. Another criticism, this is application state. Um, event sourcing, why yes, in theory, can be interpreted as um, application state overall if you have a log for the entire application but you certainly can divide this into substreams and event sourcing can be defined as the history of one entity or one subsystem or any level of scope that you want to use this with um, even if the other parts are also event sourced and the fidelity of whether those things are in sync or not or they're stored in the same place is an implementation um, detail um, or architecture detail that you can choose to do. So uh, I guess for simplicity is trying to talk about um, application state overall uh, to get the concept across but certainly when you're working with event sourcing as we have for uh, well I personally have for 15 years and uh, professionally with uh, a dedicated team that's only doing event sourcing every single day for the last uh, nearly nine years now, nine years this year, so it'll be a decade next year. Uh, that's certainly not how we uh, dissect things. There may be a few places where this uh, view 
of event sourcing works, maybe some larger reports as projections that need to look at nearly all uh, types of events in the log, but this uh, this is definitely the exception, not the rule. Maybe for illustrating the purposes, like illustrative purposes here, it's good, but um, certainly uh, multi-tenancy, separate entities, separate users, and all those things really do divide up this thing, so you, I would rarely call it application state. And it has an, imp now this sounds kind of like just kind of some audit or logging function, and of course the term event log kind of reinforces this, but it's not just like a regular logging situation because there's another key characteristic of an event source system, and that is at any time I can blow away the application state completely, and then I can replay it from the event, replay the event log and rebuild the application state. And I can be confident. You sure could, but if your application is 10 years old, you would never really want to do that. You don't want downtimes of uh, two days to replay everything. Uh, so again, great way to sell this, and it's my big criticism in the way that event sourcing has been sold. Uh, there's been a few places that have tried to implement this where it's an all or nothing replay everything and magically you'll have your application yes true in theory in practice you're talking about terabytes of data uh, to move across and and just to project what that is what's missing in uh, in this explanation here is that you don't have to do that it's a nice to have and you don't want to do that because you want to have uh, an idea of which part of the log actually is responsible for your system being you know, uh, able to run and have the integrity of having correct state. And this can be done with things like snapshots and uh, uh, closing the books on certain uh, streams, etc. And more importantly, um, and what's not ever talked about is the streams, uh, sorry, the, uh, the projections that are across multiple streams and how you cache those and have snapshots of those. Those are rarely talked about but you really do want to have a very small data footprint to keep your application running. And unfortunately, this, this argument here uh, doesn't do event sourcing much good. Um, it certainly doesn't sell it well. Confident that I have a usable application state as a result of that. And that's the characteristic that makes it event sourced. The events are, in the end, the fundamental source of truth. So we can always go back to them and rebuild our application state. So, hands up. How many of you built something that's done this approach? We've only built things using this approach for companies that are small and worldwide enterprises for nearly nine years now. I wouldn't do it any other way. Build a system with this approach. A few people, okay? How many of you used a system that uses this approach? Put your hands up if you've used a system that works this way. Okay. Put your hands up if you're a programmer, computer programmer. Put your hands up again if you've, if you've used a system that has used this approach. Now, a few more are sticking your hands up now. You're beginning to realize there's a trick question here. Every programmer these days should have used a system that uses this approach. Could I? Um, I pre-watched this, but I th maybe I'll comment on it later. Accountants have used this system every single day. Here are some examples of it, please. Yes, basically any source control system operates this way. No, it doesn't. Source control, in theory, captures change, or it is simply capturing a snapshot of an entity. That's a, one of the worst things, worst examples of event sourcing is to compare it to a uh, version control system. Right? Any source control system has, at least logically, a history of all... At least logically. Right, you picked something that is totally, fundamentally not event source to de demonstrate event sourcing. All the changes you ever made to your source code system and you can rebuild your current state at any time. Right? You, go you never rebuild current state in Git. You get a pointer to the last snapshot of a tree and the objects the last time you made a commit. 
it get does nothing with your history until it you tell it specifically only the time you look at history is when you run git log or do some sort of merge where it has to go back all the way to the uh, merge base to find out what the common ancestor is and try and figure out things for you um, and and then there's nothing that's event sourced it's literally analyzing data changes between different snapshots of state go so, so git checkout master or you know because we all use git these days right and you build your application state Essentially, that's the essence of event sourcing. It's treating our data the way that we treat our code with a source control. It's not. We, we certainly don't look at the history of how the code got there to make our decisions of what we're going to write next. That, that is what event sourcing is fundamentally, is looking at the history of what happened to make uh, better decisions as to what we're going to do and enable those changes. So. Um, I disagree. Um, what Git, what Git uh, stores is snapshots of current state. Event sourcing tracks the intention and the state changes explicitly as as themselves. You could think of Git storing only snapshots if you're comparing it to an event store system, and uh, event sourcing only storing diffs. Um, so if you were to make a version control system that was event sourced, you would actually just store the diffs, not the actual blobs and objects, which is what Git does. Control system in place. And in fact, most questions that come to event sourcing can actually be resolved by saying, well, what does a source code control system do? And most of the benefits, and to some extent the costs, can be analyzed by thinking of that way. Now, I'm not going to really talk very much on the how you build this, because that's its own topic, and I'll explain a bit more. It's a topic that's incredibly short, that could be covered in three or four sentences. About why I don't talk about it at the end, I'm going to focus a little bit more on why this is worth investigating, why you should think about doing this, the sum of all of the system that you have. Now, one reason that probably leaps to tra mind, people's mind right away is that it gives us an audit trail. Right? Every change to our data is logged which would happen in any kind of logging system, of course, but it's logged in a particularly strong way. Because we're relying on it as a source of truth, because it becomes a, a processable log. Well, that is the first good point, that we make a difference between source of truth, log, and passive logging. Oops, logging with something like uh, log4j, etc. Um, those things are not reliable and horrible. Um, so that's, I'm glad he brought that up. We have much more confidence in it than we have. I'm not sure what the, happened with the recording here, but the camera lost focus. So maybe we'll be able to see the slide later in just something where we're just writing off some to a text file somewhere. And it's again, just like with our source code. We have to rely on that history in the source code uh, repository. And we do rely on it to a great extent because we know we can run it any time to build the state of our system. So that's the first reason. That's actually quite a powerful reason. If you're in a situation where... Uh, I would say it's so powerful that I would give up all unit tests um, if it was a decision between unit tests or having an event log for an event source system, I would definitely keep the event log over the unit tests because I could get out of any bug or regression by inspecting the history of state changes um, rather than relying on some interpretation of what should happen in, in test cases. Um, like Fred Brooks said, data is king. Auditability is a crucial aspect of your, of your data. This is immediately something to consider. That's going to give you a lot of auditability. And if you think about it, this is how accounting transactions work. If you've ever done any stuff in accounting and posting of entries and double entry bookkeeping and things of that kind, you know that you don't think about posting, or you don't think about just crediting or uh, subtracting or adding to a balance is not how you do things. 
you create posting entries that you don't change and you add them up to get your balance. It's the same principle. And in fact, that's in many ways how I first came across it, was working with accounting systems. Another great advantage of this approach is that it gives you a really powerful debugging technique. What you can do is you can take your system and you can take a production system and effectively copy it um, into a lab and then see what happens in terms of something went wrong. So this is what I'm talking about um, just from the last night, how important that is. So there's been cases in our like all the people that have worked for us where they've and I personally have done this as well is taking production uh, snippets of of the log to really see why there's a bug or missing information or wrong information for a certain user when they're trying to do something or they're not able to do something um, that has been uh, incredibly powerful so um, you don't need a lab uh, you can because the way events are stored they they don't need any dependencies and transformations from one state to the next given the history and processing of a command is incredibly lightweight so you don't need the word lab there this is your laptop probably don't even need your laptop you could probably have it in some uh, I don't know github online code editor um, it's incredibly lightweight to be able to do this um, especially if you can um, uh, stream a part of the events uh, easily um, and I think this is one of the issues with uh, uh, different technologies being used to store the events whether it's a database and the specific events table um, flat files which work the best I think I, I think we should really be working on actual file systems that um, that have event sourcing capability built into them um, with hard links and other things uh, rather than having an application on there but anyway that's a advanced topic um, my point here is that the word lab um, really makes it seem a lot heavier than it is. This process of investigating what's in production is way, way lighter than what you would do um, in a traditional uh, project. When I was working at Pay by Phone, we had millions of transactions for parking, um, and to find a bug, you know, we had a giant Oracle install where all these transactions were, and all the different records that were involved um, through some sort of a referential integrity. Uh, it was it was a rat's nest and and having to ask for two gigabytes of the latest uh, piece of production database to try and find something getting through you know an entire day of debugging to find the problem um, only to find that you're missing a record which is even older and then asking for another snapshot or another uh, table population thing for for something else it, it was just a nightmare um, none of that happens with event source systems so think of your worst nightmares of of needing to get um, a production-like environment locally to dissect an issue. Um, this is night and day. Event sourcing doesn't do that, and, and it certainly doesn't require a lab for you to do that. So if something goes wrong, you take your copy of the system and you replay the events. And you can see... Yeah, when you have pet a petabyte of information, you don't just simply take uh, a copy of your system. That's, that's crazy. And, um, and it's actually uh, worse in traditional stuff. Just, just not knowing how many implicit or explicit relationships on data you have. Some of those relationships on data are not expressed as foreign keys and actual entries. They may be calculated and encoded and assumed by convention or, or other things. And that's, that is a mystery you do not want to be needing to uh, unravel just to see if you need to have all of that. So yeah, you wouldn't want you wouldn't want the system where you have to have the whole thing uh, coming through. Um, you need a, an easier way to dissect which parts you need, and um, event sourcing is like one of the best ways to get rid of all those issues and really understand um, how state changed in your system. You can add extra monitoring code to find out what's going on. Um, you can you know, replay more than once. It gives you a great ability to replay what's gone wrong in, in a system. 
And I've often heard people say that this can be a really, really nice way because I'm no longer relying on how good with my log message is in, in the logging side of things. I can actually replay events and manipulate and see how it, what happened in a really rich debugging environment. So that's the second reason for using this is debugging. The third reason would occur to you pretty much immediately if you're thinking about source code control. Because we've got this notion of event log and an application state, we can take the event log, we can wind it back to the beginning, and then wind it forward to any intermediate state. If we want to say, what did our view of the world look like six months ago, we can just do this. We've got an ability to do historical querying that's much, much power, more powerful than a lot of other techniques do. Now, there are various patterns you can do to embed historical state into your application state itself. You know, you can keep records with, uh, um, you know, the time started and the time um, suspended on, the, on your database tables. I mean, lots of people do that, right? They have the dates on the uh, effectivity dates on the database tables, things yeah, I don't think effective dates are a good way to explain that. Um, that's what you would do for, let's say, a tax change. You would have an effective date January 1st, 2025. Tax rate is now 6%, where it was 5%. Um, th that's, that's not the right way to explain this. Um, I think what people do usually, if they are trying to attain any kind of audit, is uh, history tables, where you store old entries of records um, in the associated uh, parent table and uh, and then change the the actual tables you're changing so uh, but again that's haphazard and uh, it's an afterthought so it's not a, it's definitely not a replacement for event sourcing things like that kind I've got a whole bunch of patterns on my website that talk about how you can do this in a nice object use objects to do this in a way that gives you a nice API for manipulating that and that is useful and necessary for many systems but if you really want to be able to dig back into the past states, if you have an event log, you can always do that, even if you didn't design your system with that in mind in the first place. So that historical capability is very strong. And of course, we know how useful that is in software. If you want to go back to the state of your code six months ago, you just do git, reset, put a check-in number, and you can roll back and see what it looked like. And then you can diff between what was um, there and back and forth as well. So historic state is a very powerful feature. Now another interesting thing about doing something like this is that when you have a system with event sourcing in place, it makes it really easy for you to then populate other systems in order to handle um, updates. Because you've got a single stream of events that you can then pass on to those additional systems. And this, in fact, leads to a whole style of application out there, that's an architectural style called CQRS, which separates the processing of updates. I just conflated two things. Um, CQRS is in, within one system, but he introduced this as having events that are more easily published to other systems to have them get a state update from that. A good example is... Um, inventory and point of sale to subsystems that have to work together when something gets sold you need to publish that event so that the inventory system can then update its view of what uh, pieces exist in in the back room um, and are available for maybe online orders and things like that so it's you know having better careful wording around this part of the presentation would have gone a long way um, because now someone has an idea that CKRS is, you know, tying two separate microservices together, which is not necessarily the case. CKRS is usually just a, uh, you know, it's just a way of making sure that you're, you have a separate way of handling your rights, adding information or changing state of your system versus having uh, the scalability um, issues addressed a different way of providing information to external queries. So um, that's, that's quite important. That's a quite important distinction here that wasn't made. Um, again, not to be too critical, this is a presentation on event sourcing and not CKRS. From the provision of queries.
Now, events aren't necessary for CQRS. You don't have to use an event-sourced approach, but the two naturally go together. No, they don't naturally go together. Um, CQRS is implied if you're doing event sourcing. Even if you query your events directly, that projection itself is the query side of CQRS. Uh, so the only way that you could probably more formally define CQRS is that you're materializing and caching those queries or parts of the queries or using memoization or other ways to make sure that you're only updating those met materialized query results with new events that are relevant. Um, and, and most times I hear people using CQRS, they're using event sourcing as well. And this gives us the ability to, for instance, have multiple um, query systems, which can be very handy if your system has a very high query load and complex updates. So it's really weird that he had to bring in CQRS to explain this. Um, you can explain event sourcing and the fact that it has to provide different projections for different purposes as queries um, over the same uh, large set of all events that you have. And then it's just a functional paradigm of paring, uh, paring down all of these things. Oh, good, we have Beamologist here. Um, so thanks uh, for joining. Um, do uh, chime in with your own um, ideas and criticisms. We can discuss that um, at length as well. I'm going to try to make some of these ask me anything sessions and code with me sessions kind of interactive and uh, we'll, we'll do some critiques of, of the presentation of event sourcing um, over the years because I think there's been really bad information out there about what it is and uh, so we kind of have to uh, make a lot of these recordings where we go through this with a fine tooth comb like this and analyze what's being said because most people know who Martin Fowler is and they're going to copy paste the link for this video and send it to their colleagues and this is what they'll understand event sourcing to be right so those of us that have been practicing this day in and day out every single day for more than a decade, gonna be close to two decades in a few years here, uh, there's way better advice and understanding of what to do and what not to do than people that have been kicking the tires. And I'm sorry to say that even guys that quote unquote came up with the term event sourcing doesn't guarantee that that's what they've been using. That was a paper he wrote in 2005, December 2005. And as far as I know, um, it was an extrapolation of some of the theory behind some of the LMAX uh, uh, project that he was working on, the Lon London Money Exchange for ingesting a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of history there of what it was used for in one project and gave ideas to write a theoretical thing about this approach. But, you know, to not have... Now obviously, if you're just experimenting with something, you're not going to all of a sudden recommend it to every single other person. But... Um, we have and we've only done that because we saw the the fo the folly of throwing information out and events so if you decide to not throw information out because you don't know what your business logic is going to be next year and having all state available that you ever had is an advantage and so we decided that that was logically the best way to develop something so that you're not you're never painting yourself in a corner so you can actually do all the work in the update and then send off to, to multiple um, query loads. A particularly interesting approach of this is that it actually allows you to have different schemas in your different query areas. So you can actually design a separate schema for each of your different query needs. So some might want to include a lot of historical information and others not. Again, having the event log allows you to process this all in different ways. So that's a... The multiple schema uh, argument is, is quite good. Um, I'm going to give them bonus points for bringing that up. Um, yeah, because if, if you just talk about event sourcing, a lot of people just get um, stuck on the fact that uh, you know, you're replaying history and that's great to see what happened. Um, but rarely do people understand that this is a very good way to support multiple models. Because you can support multiple models without event sourcing, but coordinating them becomes a nightmare. 
if you're doing event sourcing and supporting multiple models, what the event log gives you is a trusted source of truth that disambiguates any opinion about which model is right. The event sourcing is best represented by the fact that you are capturing as fact what happened at that point in time with the minimal information stored to um, effectively change the system to what you want it to be. There is no argument. The person typed in this information on this screen and pressed save. Everything else is secondary. If you need to have a trigger that kicks off something else to put in some default value into some other table, that is secondary. That is not what happened. What happened is that the user added this new information to the system at this time and everything else is an order of magnitude less important and I think that is the best way to, to talk about that and that forces you to have multiple models because that representation of that val of those values on that screen a can be not complete maybe what if it's one step of a, of a wizard that's filling out a larger record that you're gonna that you're gonna need somewhere else uh, you know, any number of these types of arguments can say that that is not the model you want. That is definitely just the model that best represents the ability to capture information correctly from a user, which is great. That is, that is a great goal to have, and that's what should happen. But that model is not guaranteed, or most likely is not going to be the best model for presenting information in other parts of the workflows or other workflows in the system or other systems. But it is the most important representation of that data because it is what actually happened at that time. So good that he actually talks about multiple models. I think a lot of um, people that present um, event sourcing um, don't do that. Uh, unfortunately, he's using the CQRS crutch for that. You don't need to um, talk about CQRS to talk about multiple models. But there's a problem. Um, and it's a problem that I alluded to already in terms of microservices. Um, if you've got this kind of system, you lead to this problem of inconsistencies. Some events will have got into one system and not into others. So as a That's life. That's information systems. No matter how well you hide that under a database that gives you a transactional acid properties and all that, the reality is that the real world and information flows with latency. Uh, there is the speed of light and the speed of information at its extreme, but n the whole universe is not consistent. So, big deal. As a result, you lose your strong consistency and you end up with eventual consistency. Now, in fact, there are other problems as well with CQRS. Um, I... It's a, it's, a, it's a technique that, in the, with the appropriate problem and with skilled hands, it can be quite effective. And I've certainly come across people who have used CQRS and found it very valuable. But I have to say, it is the minority of people I've talked to that have used it. Um, and I'm so just because something is not popular doesn't mean it's worse. Um, a lot of people don't know how to drive a race car, but in order to win a race, uh, you should know how to drive a race car and get in one and go fast. I'm not saying here that I've talked to kind of any old developer. I've talked to developers that I think are at least in the upper quartile. And I would say that most of the people that have used it have gotten themselves into trouble. CQRS is difficult to do well. No, it's not difficult to do well. It's difficult to do well with everyone around you throwing wrenches in the gears about not wanting to move forward, etc. This is something that continues to be denied by the industry um, and saying, oh, CQRS is only available for these smart shops and event sourcing is only to be done here. The real problem is an education problem and not just an education problem, but actual dysfunction of the industry to say that, oh, we can't afford to know this, etc. cetera. Um, that is just an adoption thing. I can tell you that shops that do adopt it they end up having junior people, not this quarter percentile. I mean, we can throw ev event sourcing slices at junior people in our company without any risk. So what's, what's the difference between us and what he's talking about here? Um, the difference is, is that we've tested this. We've uh, used it more than in anger. We've bet the entire company 
and its success on this approach and it's worked out wonderfully with junior people. And so you should be very wary um, about using this approach. You should be very wary of being made wary of this approach. I mean, I'm not saying don't use it because there are definitely cases where it's very applicable, but you should... It's very applicable to most cases. In fact, this is a better default approach than all the agile silver bullets you're spewing most of the time. Any of these consultants um, will say, yeah, everything's got a backlog. You shouldn't really worry about your design and what it's going to be. You're going to have, you're going to react to your customers and all that kind of stuff. This is all related. Sort of wear extra strong protective goggles and all that kind of stuff when you use it. Yeah, as long as you have your entire history of events that happened, um, where's the extra strong protective goggles in other systems? This is, if you get in trouble with an event source system, you can start using different events if that's where your mistake was. If you made a mistake in one of the projections, you rewrite the projection and, and redo it. If the projection takes too long to, to repopulate, you start introducing tombstoning and, and caching and uh, snapshots and other things. Um, all of these things are not a paint yourself in a corner situation like you get with the traditional approach. With m one giant schema, again, I, I say this in a lot of uh, my videos, is uh, you can get to a situation where you simply cannot upgrade to another schema version and it's easier to port uh, new features to an older version that a client has, which is something that just doesn't happen in the systems we build with event sourcing. Uh, we have definitely seen people get into a lot of trouble with this. But even without that... I've seen people get into a lot worse trouble by not using this. This notion of being able to support variant output states, because basically anybody can consume that event log and build their own application state, and those application states don't have to be the same. That's a very valuable property of event sourcing. The event It's not just uh, at that level. You could lose all your source code and rebuild the entire application based on the fact that you have all the events. And this goes back again to the importance of data that Fred Brooks wrote about years ago. Event log can be consumed by multiple systems that can build their own view of the world. And that can be handy for all sorts of different reasons that are not necessarily connected to CQRS. And of course you've got the uh, distribution support. If you need to build a distributed system, such as if you're using microservices, then events make it a lot easier. And again, go back to that thinking of using source code control systems. How does Git work so well as a distributed system? It's because it has this notion of being able to deal with lots. Now, there's an com important complexity. It's not just Git, it's every single system that we've had outside of automating systems with computers. Every single system out there has had logs as a way of working. The reason that it's looked at su as such an oddball in information systems is because storage of data was incredibly expensive in the formal years of defining all of these patterns from the earliest transistors all the way through to the early 90s um, the expense of storing data uh, was ruts in this in this way of building systems that it's incredibly hard to get out of it's still entrenched in academia you still learn about third normal form that is uh, still looked at as the epitome of good data uh, stewardship and all this other stuff it's it's horrible so let's see, some other people have, the beamologist is still talking here, this is great. So a statement from the following, for, for the follow up. Uh, people have been focusing too much on data first instead of process first when defining bounded context teams stop at the static data model instead of looking at the process as a coherent unit. Yeah, uh, so yeah, the whole idea data or behavior, I mean, I, I, I definitely think they're both uh, inter, intertwined, I mean, you really, I mean, with event modeling, we start to describe systems as what data gets introduced at what point in time to understand what the behavior is. And we give those collections of data meaningful names 
to do that and we give meaningful names to stretches of those state transitions and state views to to talk about you know a, a larger workflow or, or things like that um, yeah so yeah if people are are focusing too much on on data first and they're just looking at well at, in this particular point in time there's a person record that's related to an address record that's related to this order uh, blah 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 yeah exactly and if you try to make that the what academia teaches is that you know that is you're supposed to have one model that's going to you know best fit all the things your system will do well that's just a horrible way of, of doing that going back to the multiple model um, the best thing you can do is to make sure you focus that your process and the behavior happens exactly as you want and designed and you make the data fit that um, you coordinate the different views via something like an event uh, event log so um, yeah um, let's uh, let's continue on but that's a good point here of course what happens what's the equivalent in general of a merge I mean the reason that git works so well with merging and you know we've all had difficult git merge conflicts to deal with in the past I'm sure it's not always I still hate this git equivalent um, for event sourcing, but whatever, let's see where it goes. Straightforward, right? Um, is in the end, its view of the, its data structure is merely a big blob of text. And, and if it's a binary, you know, all bets are off, right? But if it's text, it can, it can do a lot. But it's not perfect, and it's really a relatively simple data structure. A lot of the data structures where we want to manipulate are more complex. And we have to think, what does it mean to get a conflict? And how, what does it mean to merge? Can we merge? We have to raise those kinds of issues when we go down the distribution path. But if we can come up with some sensible diff and merge facility, then we've got some really powerful tools that we could use. Even if we can't automatically merge all the time, if we can give the user a UI that allows them to merge two states in a sensible way, then... So I've worked at uh, some insurance companies that have had... Uh, policy histories or other histories uh, as events and presented through a git like merge um, you know two sides and the histories and all that so there are some ways that's been used but um, it's definitely the exception uh, yeah that's like less than one percent of any events or system <laughs> we begin to talk about some really quite capable um, features. And in many ways, one of the things that most interests me in event sourcing is the sense that why shouldn't we give our users the kind of capabilities that we get from source code control systems? On the whole, we haven't given them to our users. And that's exactly what the purpose of that insurance company's uh, system was, to make sure that the actuaries had um, a ledger of changes and if there were concurrent changes and things like that they could revise that and compare and essentially do what you would do in Git but for the end user. Um, I mean I, I hated doing this I'm you know when I'm used putting slides together I have no way to diff two presentations in Keynote in some sensible way even in a... You shouldn't be using Keynote then you should be using a textual representation maybe you should be using open source software anyway but that's a topic for another talk. Silly way, just to know which slides have changed would be useful at times. I saw. And, yeah, and all this like stupid Apple ass kissing is driving me crazy. Yeah, Keynote and, uh, and FaceTime, whatever. Well, I store my presentations in Git because I like to have that history, but it's undiffable and that definitely reduces its effectiveness. And I think we should think about more about how we give our users the kind of facilities that we now take for granted as programmers. So I've talked about this notion of an application state in a log. And one of the interesting things is that we can really separate these things out. Separate them out to the degree that we don't actually have to keep the application state on disk. Usually when I talk to people about this kind of thing, the application state is a database. You know, it's, it may be a relational database or whatever your database of source is, it's a database just like you work with. But it can be useful to say, let's actually treat that application state as purely an in-memory structure. And if something happens... 
So he's sort of going back to the point I made earlier of like, yeah, you kind of don't need to have materialized views in tables to have this other application, quote unquote, state. Uh, you can start to do things in memory to be incredibly fast. And uh, all I'm saying is you can go even further and not bother with an in-memory. Um, if, if you have a fast disk for the recent parts of the log, uh, you could simply query the event store itself. It happens and the computer crashes, I can always rebuild it from the, from the log. Now this opens up a whole new way of thinking about how we can process and architect our systems. Uh, it's an approach I refer to as a memory image, and I've seen it used rarely, but really quite intriguingly when it's been pulled off. I first came across... P pulled off? It makes it sound like it's uh, some incredibly hard thing to do. This is like one of the easiest things to do. And in fact, you should probably start with something like that when you're learning event sourcing and uh, just start caching or optimizing your queries and it'll just fall out by itself. You don't even have to think about it and you'll get it. Cross it because it was the way that Smalltalk holds all its code. It does every, did everything for an memory image and any old Smalltalkers in the room will remember that. And that gave it some very nice capabilities that were really revolutionary at the time. More recently, there's a great example of a system, and you can find it um, via that uh, uh, link on my page, um, for uh, 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 stock trading called LMAX. Um, and they used a very high-performance, low-latency system that, re that did really very complex business logic, and it relied on the fact that it was running all the time in memory. It was run as a single um, threaded Java system, because it had to be single threaded um, to get the maximum performance, and they could process a ridiculous amount of transactions just on commodity hardware. And it You'll notice that event sourcing is always there when there's any extreme pressure on a system, whether it's performance or anything like that. Event sourcing is nearly always the answer. So the question is, why is it not the default approach? There is no good reason why it's not the default approach. It, it, it was very interesting when they talked about this because it totally um, subverted what most people thought. You think you need to have lots of processes and maybe some actor-based structure. Well, they tried that and they measured it and they found it didn't work terribly well. It was much better just run a single thread providing they could get all their working set into memory. Well, a hell of a lot fits in memory these days. Um, has anybody gone to the very simple website, doesn'tfitinmemory.com? Um, it's really quite staggering how much you can get in memory. And then if you can get it in memory, then you haven't, haven't got to do any database mapping. You can build any data structure you like, however complex, and you can manipulate it really, really fast. The only thing that you have to do is make sure that you, can, you do event sourcing and you can rebuild the system from the logs when necessary. Well, Commonly people do, of course, um, when they do this, is they don't replay every event since the beginning of time. Conceptually you do that, but it's like, again, what the version control systems do. They don't actually do that when you get check out some weird branch. They actually store snapshots of the application state, and, it, and it's transparent to you. We don't know that the transports, unless you're going to dig around in the .git directory and start futzing around there, but it, it feels like you're getting all the um, commit since the beginning of time, but it's actually caching application states. And that's what they... Okay, that's a... I should stop explaining things with Git because that's just all backwards how he's presented it, so I wish he would uh, use some other example. LMAX would cache at the end of every day. They'd write out their application state, but if it crashed in the middle of the day, it would bring up that application state and then replay all the transactions up to that point. And it was fast enough that they could do that confidently. They had failovers and things like that. But again, the app, the using event sourcing helped them have hot failovers because they can take the same event and apply it to more than one instance. So they had a hot, could easily hot swap at a very um, low speed uh, latency time. So I think this approach is, I've been saying this for years, I think this approach is going to be popular soon. <laughs> That's becoming very popular and it'll continue. But there needs to be a lot of support to move people off the old ways of uh, doing things. And so, uh, again, event modeling is one of those. It just shows that events go past the technical side um, and reach way further. It gets rid of um, a lot of things that needed to be there, such as 
domain specific language frameworks and other things that uh, try to interpret or show represent requirements closer to how the implementation was going to go so you wouldn't have that mismatch and you'd be able to execute accurately to what the business wanted. Because of the degree of memory that we're getting. You may have heard Adrian Cockcroft say, you know, forget about microservices, we're talking about terror services now because... We well, that didn't age well. Um, so I think uh, 2016 we can forgive him for predicting that there would be a ton of uh, microservices. Um, we did have more of a parallel uh, with uh, not microservices, but uh, but serverless, where you just don't bother calling these things services anymore and uh, just look at it function by function. We're talking about boxes with terabytes of memory attached. And I think this is going to be the... Okay, so he meant about how much memory each microservice might have, which is like kind of a weird way to optimize, but sure. Um, uh, I'm going to predict again that this will become a more popular technique. I was wrong last time, so you know, take that with a pinch of salt. But I think he's not wrong. In 2016, we had way more um, event source systems than we had when you wrote about this in 2005, and even when uh, certain technologies were being developed, like Event Store DB and all this stuff in uh, 2010, 2011. So by 2016, we've had a ton of uh, frameworks, a ton of people moving to this. So um yeah i mean I, i'm guessing I, I didn't see a lot of promotion of the approach from from him during those years and i don't know <laughs> maybe if he did there'd be even more but i certainly didn't see um event uh, event sourcing at the center of the tech radar on thoughtworks the in-memory processing aspect of this approach is really quite interesting now then, another thing, and again, if you think in terms of source code control, one of the nice things about this is we can take a production database and we can say, hmm, what happened? Let me investigate if something else happened. Let's copy it over to some alternative state, and then take that alternative state, blow away the application state, take the event log, and weave in an event that didn't happen. You might think, what would be an example of this? Actually, it was one of my first, a very good example of using this. It was on a payroll system. What happens when you find out you, you know, some highly unionized automotive factory, you've paid everybody their payroll run for last November, and now somebody says, oh, so-and-so didn't work the hours that we said. He worked an extra four hours. That kind of thing would cause a huge amount of complexity because they had to figure it out the, by hand. And the consequences could be huge. That four hours could send you over an amount that gave you an extra day of vacation or qualified you for some different pension rights. The consequences of that change were very complex to calculate. And people could spend a day or two figuring out what was going on. And of course, lots of room for error. But in this approach, you could just go back, remove the bad event, put a new event in, and then having done that, replay the application, and you've got a new application state, which is not a real application state. This doesn't exist, but it's what the application state should have been had that event actually been processed correctly. I like what it's saying about the power of event sourcing, but it is also wishful thinking from another perspective. Uh, there's a lot of cascading effects of what happens in history. So even if you put in an alternate event or an extra event in there, Who's to say that some processor is not going to react to a view of one of the views that's influenced by that type of event and throw in some other entries? And if we had the same source code, it would be a lot easier. But these entries can be at any particular point in time. So not only are you replaying the state for this particular uh, way of uh, simulating the system, but you also need to simulate the deployment of new business logic um, and uh, and new uh, projection uh, uh, logic as well uh, because the source code you're running now is different than what was running to interpret that event at that time in some projection that was on some person's screen I and mean, it's not even something that you can automate because in that year someone 
when they're talking about vacation allotment or something, you know, that could have had a human component where there was an approval process and, uh, and something appeared on a computer screen in front of someone that's working there and they decided to press a button where they wouldn't have pressed that button otherwise. There is no way to simulate that because humans were part of running that system. So I get where it's going and it's incredibly powerful, but I don't think it's the full picture and what happens. Further, you don't need to replay the entire application state. A lot of these types of errors are caught by one of the reports that you can say, given this history, what does this report look like when they should have had that vacation time given to them that year? And things like that. That is a real live, like that's a real way of using it. And so one of the differences and why I'm making this video is to show you the difference between theory and practice. He, Martin doesn't implement stuff anymore. He doesn't only work in event source systems, as he said himself. He would want to see more systems like this, but I don't think anyone has done events sourced only like we have for the last eight years and myself for the last 15 years as the only way to automate information systems. So maybe me giving some feedback to people watching this video, you'll be able to take a grain of salt with some of the things that are said um, or not, you temper your expectations um, or um, actually get more courage to do the things that he said to be wary of because there's, I certainly sense an imbalance of what the theory that he's presenting is and what the reality is um, on the good and bad side. And then you need some way to look at the diffs. For our payroll system, looking at the diffs was relatively straightforward because in the end it comes down to money and accounts. So we could just look and see how many difference is it in terms of a monetary system. Um, that is not you know, a common case, but it can be incredibly powerful when you use it well. And I've seen it used a few times and it, it does take, I mean it can take a long time to process the events to do that and I remember people saying, oh performance wise, oh my god, I mean it can take minutes to calculate this. But the alternative is a human being taking days. No, not minutes. It, after one of the businesses we were dealing with, um, it took two days for seven years worth of history. It can be a lot worse. Please do it. And so you prepared to pay that price. So that working through of alternative results, that's another very useful consequence um, of this approach. So these are all things to consider. If, if any of these or some combination of these sounds like something useful, then you should start thinking about using event sourcing. Um, how many people, uh, uh, we had the hands up earlier on, how many people have built a system using this? Um, okay, so just keep your hands up for the moment um, and leave your hands So there's way more benefits than this. Event sourcing has a benefit of being able to uh, articulate your requirements a lot better. Um, event sourcing has a way to employ way fewer patterns so that development isn't as a hard thing to do for people. You're only following very few patterns. I mean, you're, you're basically getting a command handler to el establish whether you can store a resultant event or not. And then you have a bunch of um, event handlers to build up views. And that's really two patterns. And maybe you can throw in a couple more for some automation and to-do lists or some async stuff, processors or sagas or whatever you want. You have literally two to four patterns that you're using over and over again. So the simplicity of your systems is incredibly high compared to uh, just the default of go ahead and throw in whatever patterns you want to get the job done. Sounds good on paper, get whatever, t but the amount of variance in your code base is huge. Um, that's where the merge conflicts and the absolute, the darkness you're left in with your estimates and the stupid t-shirt sizing that takes place instead. Uh, there's a ton of benefits. This is this is not even half of the benefits of event sourcing. Hands up if you felt it was a good choice for what you used it for and you would do it again for that project. No, I can't see a, a better way. Not seeing many of those hands go down. Okay, it's just a quick saw. So not many people, but it clearly was quite successful for them. But there are some problems to think about. 
And it would be remiss of me, because I'm me, I can never talk about the good thing without also talking about the bad thing. I always, you know, choices of architecture are never simple good, bad. It's always a case of trade-offs and context. So what are some of the disadvantages of event sourcing? Well, top of the list, of course, it's unfamiliar. It's not a technique that many people know how to use. And as a result, the programming model is unusual. The idea that every change has to be turned into something that's a processable thing, stored away, and then I... You can learn this in a day versus trying to learn Hibernate or some other ORM or some other JavaScript framework for your UI. This is a drop in the bucket. So unfamiliarity, not a big deal. Have to apply it. It's actually not that hard once you get used to it, but it initially kind of feels a bit unusual. And that unfamiliarity is, is enough to throw some people. The second point is actually one of the biggest dangers. Um, and it's a kind of subtle point. A lot of people, when they hear about event sourcing, they think, oh, in order to do this, I need to have asynchronous processing of my events across my different parts of the system. Now, sometimes that is the right thing to do. Microservices, for instance, is a case where you, you kind of have to embrace the asynchrony to get decent performance. But a lot of the time, you don't need asynchrony. There's no inherent reason that you have to use asynchronous processing for event sourcing. Again, think of Git. When I'm doing the local commit and going just git commit, is it, is it asynchronous? No, it's a completely synchronous operation. There's asynchrony going on when we push and pull and we've got multiple repositories. And well, that's a really good point. I'm glad he brought that up because it is something that is a problem with a lot of uh, people introducing event sourcing is they get tangled up in some, oh, I can just use this framework to do that. I've, it's, it's definitely something you should build yourself to understand so that you don't get stuck into something that tries to do everything for everyone and has uh, asynchronicity built in. So async, not necessary. Yeah, uh, the simplest thing you can do is when that form gets uh, su submitted by the user, when they hit save or whatever, go to next, uh, take some action on the UI, you're writing uh, to a database, that event, or to a flat file, and you could even say that you can run all the subscriptions to that event at that particular point and synchronously run anything that they kick off. Um, so I'm glad he brought that up. That's, uh, that is not being asynchronous has nothing is a separate issue from event sourcing itself. And all that kind of stuff, but the actual basic commit and uh, thing is not. If I'm using a centralized version control system, and I remember subversion back in the day, that was again, a synchronous operation, right? I mean, so there's no reason why you have to be asynchronous to use event sourcing. But I've often heard people say that the two are inherently linked. In fact, one of the problems is I've run into cases where people said, oh, we have it used event sourcing and it was a disaster. And I kind of probed a little bit more because I want to understand how these techniques don't work. And then I'd say, well, because it was all the asynchrony involved. OK, so it's not the event sourcing is the problem. It's the asynchrony, which I know is a known problem. So that's a known complexity issue. Another one that, that comes from this, and it's kind of similar kind of situation, is... Just on that last point, um, that just goes to reinforce that a lot of people are using way too much infrastructure to try and have a thousand different capabilities just to start to use event sourcing. Event sourcing is actually quite easy to add in capabilities as you need them. Uh, in fact, it's incredibly resilient to changing entire frameworks and infrastructures. Uh, when needed. Uh, we had a project that needed to be on-prem and we were developing it the whole time thinking it's in the cloud and on in the 11th hour we were told this has to go on-prem. It wasn't, it was a, it was, it was a joke. We, we did it in two days, shipped uh, servers that were deployed on-prem um, no matter how large the system was. So uh, lots of examples of, of people thinking that they need to really understand everything immediately and, and take care of all potential problems in, uh, in the future. 
In fact, the uh, event sourcing kind of gives you the best way to enforce the agony on all sorts of levels. So I've run into situations where people say, oh, the event, saw, the event log is my source of truth, therefore I'm not going to keep an application state. Every time I want to know anything, I'm going to replay all the events. Now, don't do that, right? You all No, do that. Do that. As you run into uh, problems with uh, efficiency, you will introduce materialized views. You will introduce shorter streams. Absolutely do that. But to say that someone's going to uh, keep um, an application where it takes five minutes for a page to reload is ridiculous. You, it won't work. But there's a very simple solution to it. And you're not uh, painted into a corner with event sourcing from adding that in when you need it. So, no, absolutely query the events directly. Always, pretty much always will have an application state. It's only populated, you only rebuild it when you have to. I mean, it's just like with Git, right? I mean, you don't operate raw. The Git thing's really getting annoying. Git is the state. On the stuff that's in the .git directory, you have your working copy that you operate with. And in fact, most of your applications are unaware of the fact that there is Git. In the, in the background. I mean, clever IDEs and, and editors will have some kind of Git manipulation mode, but most of their operations completely ignore the fact that Git's present. External systems that aren't event sourced are a problem. If I'm you know, take the payroll example, I'm maybe stretching this a touch, and I'm paying in a, in a I have to do some currency conversion for some reason. Um, how, and if I have to, re, have to rebuild the application state from you know, six months ago, am I accurately going to get the currency that I actually used six months ago as a currency rate? Now, there are ways around this. There's no way around this. This is literally you treating your system with systems thinking. And that rate, if you're doing event, source cor event sourcing correctly, would have been written into the command. Um, what he's actually getting at here is the true problem with event sourcing where it's treated like a traditional system and inside the command handlers you're actually getting the external calls. You're not capturing the call to get an interest rate or an exchange rate before making the command and issuing the command. Your command handlers have to be stateless. In order to do event sourcing correctly, you are not calling to anything external in your command handlers. That's what gives you the rep replayability and all these things is pure functional paradigms. And you don't need a functional language to program it in, but you simply have immutability. You know that when you're looking at your events, you have all the information to uh, make uh, to recalculate the state. If you can't recalculate the state from your events, you're not doing event sourcing by definition. Right, I can make sure whenever I query an external system, I actually keep a copy of the thing, so it can always reconstitute. Put it in the commands, and they'll end up in the events. That is, that is information. That is external information being put into your system, and you are failing at keeping state. It's not, it's, this is an argument, uh, argument even outside of event sourcing. Do that event accurately, but it will certainly play havoc with the alternative situations where you know, the timing might change, and you know, there's no way I can tell what that past state was. External systems tend to complicate matters. No, they don't. We, we integrate with external systems for every single system we've written for nine years, and I wouldn't call it anything complicated. Um, a particularly subtle problem is identifiers. If you're creating things and giving them identifiers that are going to be exposed outside your system, you've got to make sure that they always calculate the same identifier if you replay the events. You don't recalculate identifiers. These are things that are embedded. That's why you have GUIDs and UUIDs and true random things and Snowflake IDs and whatever else. Um, they're built for purpose. This has been solved many times for many different systems, and any Joe Blow can use those in their systems. This is not something that only Facebook or some other giant company needs to use. And that is, can be a bit tricky. That can trip people up. And the schema of the events themselves, because they have to be replayable all the time, your software has to be able to deal with the fact that if you need to change the schema of the events, you still have to be able to populate things. And I've seen that get people into trouble as well. No. One of the simplest things we've ever done was to have upcasters from previous events 
it is it causes us zero problems and in fact it's such an advantage that uh, i can't fathom to think of going back to a traditional system um, schema my schema changes for anything in an event source system is the easiest way to deal with schema changes uh, there's just no way to argue against that um, upcasters take a a millisecond or nanoseconds picoseconds to to actually do that and most of the time you're putting in a a null value for a new field that you added to an event it's this is not a problem that is not a dragon well in fact if that's if that's your dragon you're definitely doing something wrong so there are definitely problems and subtleties with this approach to be aware of um i think this is a way to sell consulting that I will protect you from these potential things if you're thinking about event sourcing. Um, I don't know that I can hear that from the guy that supposedly came up with this approach, that that event schema is a problem. That's just, yeah, sorry, not, not reality for a company that's been using only this approach for so long and introducing this approach to people that are new to it. It's not just because we're experts, it's because we have people that are junior effectively using this. What unfortunately I can't give you is a really great sources of information about how to do this technique. Um, I wrote a bit about it um, in the article referenced there, um, but that was many years ago, it was back in almost 10 years ago I wrote it, and it wasn't very complete. I was looking to actually turn a whole book of that stuff, but I ended up writing the DSL book instead and I haven't had the energy to go back and work with that. Ironically, the DSL book is something that is entirely replaced and unnecessary if you're doing event sourcing, and especially if you're doing event modeling. Your events are your domain-specific language. You, re you remove the need for a whole book on the subject. I've heard of a few people starting to write books on this kind of technique, but you know, lots of people start books. It's much harder to finish them. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of information out there on how to do this well. But I think because it's so damn simple that it doesn't require a book. Of the guide of what does a version control system do is actually a very useful guide to help you. Um, at least be don't, don't learn event sourcing by studying version control systems. Begin to, to operate with this. And as you saw from the hands, a few people have used this technique and found it worked well. And another point I should stress, you don't have to do this to every part of your system. Often where I've seen this, it's only used in one or two areas where they really needed those valuable features that I mentioned. Often to do with accounting for money because... Nope. It's a simple decision. Do I want my system to lose information, yes or no? What advantage do I have in losing information? He himself said how cheap it is to store things and how you have terabytes of uh, storage and, and terabytes of memory. Why the hell would you throw information away? You gotta be off your rocker to not have this as a default. It's what money is important and it's easy to measure, so people tend to be focused on it. But it's the reason it's in money is because accounting has worked this way for thousands of years. There's no other way to do accounting. It's a worthwhile technique to bear in mind. So that's event sourcing. All right. Well, um, he had some good points, but I think. It's kind of sad to see that uh, the people that are coining some of these terms are not the ones that are pushing the gas pedal to move it as far as possible um, and get themselves involved in large companies that have to be everything to everyone and can't make a uh, line in the sand and stand behind it. Um, let's go through some of these comments on this video. I, YouTube comments usually suck, but let's just see if there's anything worthwhile in here. Uh, first thing on the top of mind is the beginning didn't get addressed in the talk. If you could roll back anywhere in the event log, you should keep the program code in sync. Yeah, well, we already made that. Uh, interesting that someone else m managed that as well. Um, anyway, there's better ways to deal with that. I don't know, this looks like there's some replies to other things. I'm not sure this, the second comment doesn't make much sense. Yeah, the, the, yeah, this is a horrible way. So this, this is a really good, really good assessment here. First part of the presentation, oh well, it looks so useful. Last part of the presentation, oh well, it gets a mess. 
yeah no it's not a mess it's it is the thing that will save you from thousands of headaches and thousands of messes the fact that it's a vehicle to get you to have multiple models at play is why you won't be in a mess every single system has that cyclomatic complexity and the coupling go through the roof and everything's a death march event source systems are the exact inverse um, well to be fair git doesn't exactly do yes well okay so other people have seen this yes and stay blah 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 okay so someone explained that I'm wondering if anyone's like yeah uh, he could have definitely talked about I mean yeah one of the interesting things about this presentation is that he didn't uh, use what others um, have uh, talked about a lot when presenting event sourcing is that databases are transaction logs that then have uh, you know store are the source of truth for what you get in the table when you look at a table and also used for replication so we are using established things at the app at the business logic level um, that databases already do anyway uh, again criticism of this git start is a bit of misleading for people less familiar with git uh, yeah, it's a common misconception that Git records changes and uh, and events. Every Git commit is, in fact, a very real way to complete snapshot of state as the files at that point in time. Uh, fancy tricks for compression. So yeah, there's the indexing uh, IDX files and all that stuff. Um, if you want to get into that, Git is f uh, is awesome to understand and how it works. Could probably have a video on that at some point. Um, so, but yeah, there's no replaying it with Git. Git doesn't do event sourcing. I have no idea why a guy of his stature would use Git to explain event sourcing. I was quite surprised. Uh, I'm hooked on uh, event sourcing. Uh, I spent three years building a very large system based on DDD CQRS event sourcing. I feel like a god. I would never have wrangled all the complexity with such, such, such thinking. And amazing the fact that it's language, blah, blah, blah agnostic nomad yeah so it's language platform agnostic yeah he didn't mention that that you could actually have a system that's quite polyglot and have multiple um, platforms involved to get a whole system built so you could have net people working with node.js with php people all of those people could work at the same time on the same code base um, especially if you start to design the system with something like event modeling to understand all more or less what all the events are going to be um, at least a lot further than you would with just plain old agile uh, backlog management and uh and then yeah like it's it is i mean there's no way it is it's it's kind of sad that this is the way that it's still sold by the guy that wrote the first article on it because it's keeping a lot of people away from from this approach and most people like eric lewis young here um once they do um event i'll give him a like here because that's a really good comment uh, it's a one-way street it's like the matrix you uh, step out of your pod and it's no way you're going back into the pod once you've taken the red pill you're you are uh, stuck in living the reality you don't want to go and uh, and work in an ignorant way um, so elixir elixir and beam so a lot of people love a lot of elixir people love um, uh, event sourcing which is great uh, so if you're not doing DD secrets event sourcing and Elixir, you're behind the evolution of our field. You don't need Elixir for that, uh, but certainly you don't need DDD. There's a there's a there's some problems in DDD. At least the uh, implementation, the tactical part of it, where where you have to do um, uh, aggregates and all that um, that that is not necessary. Um, and certainly you don't need to focus on CKRS if you're doing event sourcing. You ha have to make projections of state anyway. Uh, so, you know, this last sentence can be simplified to get 99% of the benefits. Um, so let's see what the criticisms of this are. Uh, so DDD event sourcing CQRS are just tool in the box. I hate this uh, argument. Um, I think event sourcing is actually a truer representation of information system anatomy, the way that the discovery of the atom happened. So this is, uh, you know, this this whole... Um, just under tool in the toolbox no that that also kind of paints like everything's um, made equal uh, but 
you know, a Swiss Army knife is way more useful than a lot than you know, just one screwdriver. Um, so I, I hate that uh, toolbox thing. Um, don't you think it's all about contradictory to list language agnosticism and um, yeah um, benefiting me to throw it out the window by seeing there's only one language yeah okay that's okay uh, so yeah some problem in that statement <laughs> at the end but uh, no um, maybe it's an auto generated one it's a year ago so um, any questions type them into the twitch thing here and ask me otherwise I'm gonna uh, leave it as that I'll have the recording up on YouTube as well uh, so people can see it and um, maybe we can have another uh, another session later so had a few people um, join I'm gonna again try to stick to some sort of schedule but I got a lot of stuff to work on and seem to be everywhere all the time and uh, can't uh, pin myself down to a schedule quite easily a lot, a lot of uh, stuff to do but uh, thanks Cuba nice to see you uh, yeah leave me a comment I have a link to this uh, well to the twitch stream in my Twitter uh, if you want other things to be discussed about event sourcing um, or event modeling let me know there I'll try to do that next session I think I'm gonna go back to the coding of our um, accounting system for uh, for consulting company and we'll uh, move on to the um, invoices and uh, start to uh, event model and build those out with uh, event sourcing uh, from scratch so you guys can see this in action all right everyone i don't see any questions so i'll uh, sign off from now and um, for now and uh, see you uh, next time uh, probably tomorrow i'm gonna try and do this early in the morning um, to catch some of the european folks so if you're catching the recording of this um, let me know if there's something else you want me to discuss. I'll try to do that before I get coding in the morning tomorrow. So, yeah, uh, good to see everyone, and uh, we'll chat next time. Bye.